Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Unraveling Excitation Contraction Coupling, Simultaneous Measures of Intracellular Calcium and Action Potentials. This webinar has been sponsored by Ion Optics, so a big thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. Joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Patrick Schoenleitner, a research scientist for Ion Optics, and Dr. Francisco Altamirano, an assistant professor at Houston Methodist. Their presentations will discuss simultaneous measurements of intracellular calcium, membrane voltage, and contractility of cardiomyocytes. And so with that, I'm very pleased to welcome our first presenter. Patrick, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sarah. Also from my side, um, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. I'm very excited to talk the next 25 or so minutes about how to set up, record, and analyze action potentials, calcium transients, and contractility in the same preparation. First, um, I will give you a brief introduction to excitation contraction coupling and um, voltage sensitive dyes, and why you would want to perform such multi-parametric experiments in the first place. I will talk about the process of how we chose the tested um, the fluorescent dyes, and I will talk about the limitations and the advantages of this method and how well we can analyze the optical action potential data. Um, and then I will finish this first part of the webinar uh, with two real life examples. I think most of you have seen this figure or um, a very similar one already. It shows the basic components of excitation contraction coupling. The mechanism by which depolarization of the membrane and influx of calcium over the sarcolemma can trigger calcium release from the internal calcium stores. The released calcium binds to the myofilaments and initiates contraction. The calcium is then taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum or transported out of the cell. Once the internal calcium concentration is low enough, the cell can relax, membrane potential comes back to resting values, um, and the cycle can start again. However, this process is by far not as linear as you know, I just told you. Um, the process is tightly intertwined, where contractility or the mechanical environment of the cell can influence the action potential, uh, as well as calcium handling via different pathways. And of course, calcium via um, various transporters and pumps directly influences the action potential. Thus, to understand excitation contraction coupling in greater detail, you want to be informed about each step of this cascade, ideally at the same time. The traditional way of doing this is uh, with a patch clamp setup. It is also equipped um, to record intracellular calcium. Um, you can see the figure on the left um, depicting action potentials and corresponding calcium transients uh, taken from a 2012 circulation paper um, that um, was looking at the differences between sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation. Doing it this way requires substantial investment in terms of equipment and time. You will also need um, to find someone with a lot of experience and although it offers great control over the cell, it still it remains quite difficult and the amount of data you can generate per experimental day is limited. So what is the alternative if you want to have a better picture of excitation and contraction? Um, yeah, but you don't want to deal with the difficulties of you know, this more traditional approach. Well, in addition to the calcium dyes, you could use a fluorescence dye that can report changes in membrane voltage, so-called voltage sensitive dyes. And these voltage sensitive dyes are not new. As a matter of fact, they have been around for almost half a century. On the left, you see um, such an early trace of an optical um, action potential from the late 1970s. Back then, the compound merocyanin could be used to measure membrane potential, but the change in fluorescence for a given change in membrane voltage was pretty limited. In the 1980s, Leslie Lowe introduced the first ANAP dye, dye for ANAPs, a dye that has been used extensively in the last decades, especially in multicellular preparation. 
but still the voltage sensitivity was not all that great. Only more recently, new ANEP based dyes with um, better fluorescence characteristics um, and a completely new group of voltage sensitive dyes um, based on a completely different mechanism made it easier to record such optical potentials more reliably. There are by now are probably a few dozens of voltage sensitive dyes out there with um, different characteristics and spectra. Um, overall, you can put the dyes that might be suitable for our application into two categories, so-called electrochromic dyes and dyes that are based on photo-induced electron transfer. Um, and in the beginning, um, we didn't really know which one would work best for application. So what we did, we turned to the well-established class of these electrochromic dyes. Dye 4 is the prototype of these dyes. Um, with these dyes, the emission and excitation spectrum shifts with the change in membrane potential. So basically, the color of the dye changes ever so slightly. That means you shouldn't excite um, the dye at its peak and then just collect the emission, but you want to get the best change in fluorescence out of them. You need to excite them um, on the right red shoulder of the excitation spectrum. So when the spectrum shifts in one way or the other, the brightness or the emission of the dye changes the most. However, that is kind of problematic. Um, because you're not able to excite at the peak of the excitation spectrum, it um, requires higher light intensities. The broad spectrum makes it a bit trickier to record action potentials simultaneously with other dyes. Often the dyes have, unfortunately, still a relatively low signal to noise ratio. So you need to average um, your transients or you need to increase your light intensity even more for a reasonable signal. Um, and because those dyes tend to you know, induce photo damage, you actually want to keep the recording time limited um, or the light low. So overall, we thought that this is kind of suboptimal for our application, where we want to measure calcium simultaneously with optical action potentials at a fast sampling rate. So um, we did. Uh, we looked into the other class of voltage sensitive dyes, um, the newer ones, the based on photo induced electron transfer. Um, Fluvolt. Uh, is the commercially available representative of this group. The dye can be excited at the peak of the excitation spectrum with around 20 to 30% of fluorescence change for um, 100 millivolts of membrane potential change. The response um, is fast enough even for neuronal action potentials. So that's definitely uh, fast enough for us. And most importantly, its emission and excitation spectra are relatively narrow, so we have space to combine it with a calcium dye. In our case, we choose ROD2, um, calcium dye that relative to flow voltage shifted to the red, um, here indicated with uh, the emission maximum. Um, on the right now, you see a scheme of our optical setup. Uh, we use two LED light sources uh, for excitation, and we use two photomultiplier tubes for signal detection. And those are separated by a bunch of bandpass filters and tachoric mirrors to separate the emissions of these two dyes. Here um, you can see Fluvolt with um, the excitation and emission bands we choose. And to combine this with ROD2, we try to excite ROD2 as close to the peak as possible, but then we collect the signal much further into the red to reduce the overlap between Fluvolt and ROD2. Um, and because we also want to see what the cells um, are doing and how they are contracting, we uh, need to squeeze in some extra light to get yeah, light for the camera, for our um, myocam. So what we do is we equip the microscope with a condenser that has near infrared light LEDs, so we combine all those three measurements. So, and well, that's the theory at least. 
Um, but does this actually work? So can we measure calcium and voltage at the same time simultaneously without switching between two wavelengths? To answer this question, we performed two simple experiments. First, we loaded uh, a myocyte with fluvolt, and we excite the cell with the appropriate light source. And then we record the signals we get from both detectors. Uh, while we see a clear action potential shape uh, with great signal to noise ratio on the detector for fluvolt, we only see a um, tiny signal, roughly 1%, leading into the detector um, that it's dedicated for the calcium signal. We repeat um, the same experiment, but now we load the cells with O2. We record the signal again with both detectors. And as you would expect, or as we were hoping for, um, we see a beautiful calcium transient recorded with the row 2 detector, but now without any trace of um, signal of the calcium transient in the action potential detector. Um, and that means that we have a very good spectral separation between the dyes, and thus we don't mix the signals in any meaningful degree. So the answer to can we actually do this simultaneously is yes. And this is the proof. This is our very first experiment um, in ventricular red myocytes, loaded with uh, fluvolt and ROT2 at the same time at 37 degrees for 15 minutes, we acquire uh, both wavelength, so both dyes at the same time at, in this case, two kilohertz. Um, you can see the raw voltage trace um, on the top in the green box and the average of these five beads on the right. Below that, you can appreciate the calcium transient, also recorded at two kilohertz with row two and the average signal next to it. In the red box um, on the bottom, you see the sarcomere shortening trace that we record with our myocam at 250 hertz. So when I, I, I saw this first experiment, I was really happy. I was very stoked about it. But it is, it's not all roses. Um, there are some limitations to this method that we cannot change. Um, and that's because both dyes that we are using are single wavelength dyes. So there is no way that we can record a um, rasiometric signal from them, which means that we cannot account for motion artifacts, uh, which is really only a problem if you have like monolayers where cell contract randomly, not so much if you have just a cell in the center of a spot illumination. So for myocytes, this is kind of not a problem. It's also um, challenging to calibrate the dye, the calcium dye. So what you will get is relative diastolic and systolic calcium concentration. And because of the same thing, because it's not regimetric, dye leakage over time might impact um, the results when you perform um, repeated measures with long breaks in between. Um, but also here, it's kind of, um, not that much of a problem per se, because for most of the parameters we're looking at, we are more interested in the dynamics and they don't change no matter how you know much dye it leaks. Um, and the last one, of course, um, unlike with patching, you can clamp your membrane voltage. So when you design um, your experiment, you just need to design your experiment around this uh, limitation. There are also things that are overcomable, obstacles, so to say. Um, although fluvolt, for example, um, is not as photo damaging as certain ANAP dyes, um, it still in certain preparations shows some degree of phototoxicity. As you can see there on the bottom, it's a mouse ventricular myocyte, um, and you can compare the last uh, with the first action potential and see the last one is clearly prolonged. Um, in red, this is much less, almost no problem. And we have never come across any phototoxicity so far in, uh, for example, monolayers. Um, you will also 
need to find a balance between your um, signal to noise ratio, the acquisition speed and the light intensity. Do you want to have you know, a very good signal to noise ratio with a high sampling rate? Then you need a lot of light and you need to rec uh, um, reduce your recording time. Or are you fine with a slower sampling rate and just a moderate signal to noise ratio? Then, they co then you can reduce your light intensity and extend the recording time or record multiple times. And lastly, like again, with a lot of fluorescent dyes, um, the loading protocol uh, will depend a tiny bit on your preparation, right? So we have red mass sites that are very easy to load, like the mono layers that are also very, very simple to load. Uh, mouse myocytes can be a tiny bit more trickier. Um, but when you figure this out and you optimize your model, your preparation, and your um, uh, experiments, you can get quite a lot of data out of this. Um, and this le list is by no means complete. right? It just shows you some examples of what you can get out of, out of these traces. Um, with the action potentials, right? You can um, look at the action potential duration, at your diastolic intervals and beating rate if you have spontaneously beating cells at your cycle length. Uh, but you can also look then at the same time at your calcium transient and the amplitude of your calcium transient, transient and all the dynamics, time to peak, time to baseline, your calcium decay. And the same is true for your contractility, obviously, your amplitude, your time to uh, maximal contraction and your relaxation, your uh, maximum contr uh, contraction velocity. But you can also combine um, those traces to get even more information, right? You can look um, at how long it takes for the calcium, tra calcium transient to come back to baseline versus how long it takes uh, for the action potential to come back to baseline uh, to give you an idea of how susceptible a myocyte uh, preparation model might be for arrhythmias. Um, and you can also look, um, you can plot calcium against your sarcomere length or calcium against your voltage to get phase plots. That, uh, you, can, you, know, uh, you can exactly see when something is happening relative to when something else is happening in your calcium transient. Now, these are all the possible parameters that um, you can you know, record, but well, as a company, we have a lot of experience with calcium transients. Um, as you can see here, is a calcium transient um, and indicated the return fit. Um, action potentials look considerably different. Yeah, again, here you see the return of the action potential indicated. Um, and we optimize all our uh, algorithms and methods to analyze calcium transients. So when we started this project, we were kind of not sure of how well can we actually analyze those differently looking action potentials. So we came up with a small computational experiment. Uh, we take a model of a human ventricular myocyte. We generate, generate um, action potentials. And we vary the action potential duration by modifying potassium currents. And then we add some noise to those signals to generate different signal to noise ratios. And finally, um, we take those um, simulated action potentials and uh, action potentials with the different noise ratios. We plug it into our Iron Wizard software and our Cytosulfur software, and we compare the results we get from the noiseless action potentials and from the noisy ones. So, and this is how um, this little computational experiment looks. On the left half, you see the simulated action potentials. From left to right, uh, the simulated noiseless signals followed by an action potential with a signal to noise ratio of 36, eight, and then uh, the worst one with signal to noise ratio of two. Um, and from top to bottom in black, the baseline model in the center framed by the red box, the same model, but now 
only with 50% of the potassium current. And on the bottom in blue, the same model again, with 50% of the overexpression of this potassium current. Now on the right half, you see the um, analysis, the results we got from our software. On top, you see the goodness of fit of the return phase. So how well we can fit the return phase of the action potential with a polynomial function. Um, and as you would expect, the goodness of fit decreases over the three noise levels tested to an R of, I think only like 0 0.25 with a signal to noise ratio of two. Um, the corresponding action potential values at um, the 70% mark uh, are shown below. From left to right, the ground truth um, obviously doesn't show any variation in the action potential duration. And it really only becomes evident at a signal to noise ratio of eight. That there's some spread in the data, but still that looks very good. Only at a signal to noise ratio of two, you can clearly see that the values are all over the place. So at this signal to noise ratio, we can no longer give a you know, reasonable enough approximation of the true underlying action potential. So what we said is like, okay, we don't analyze um, any action potential that is worse than a signal to noise ratio of eight. So aside from determining the, this cutoff values like that, um, we can also um, say that we can not only predict precisely the duration of the action potential, but um, because of the difference um, in the action potential duration of the underlying model, we can also say we can accurately um, evaluate this. So we can um, determine uh, the action potential duration of, um, of a true action potential over different range of this duration. So that demonstrates that our software, it's not only precise, but also accurate enough to get uh, meaningful action potential data from those optically recorded action potentials. Now, with all the setup ready to go and our um, analysis pipeline in place, we can now look at some real life examples. Um, I will show you now what I call the 30 minute experiment in IPC derived cardiac myocytes. And I want to investigate the effect of verapamil, a calcium channel blocker that is used still in clinical practice. Um, so, a standard essay during uh, drug development looks at the effect of a drug on potassium channels. Uh, if the drug blocks too much of the potassium current, the action potential in vivo might prolong, which in turn then might lead to um, lethal to satipoin arrhythmias. Now, verapamil not only blocks calcium channels, but also those potassium channels. So if you would look at the amount of potassium current alone, that verapamil blocks, it might actually not be deemed safe enough. Um, and in these 30 minute experiments, I will show you that when recording action potential, calcium transit and contraction in a suitable preparation, uh, then you will see that verapamil is perfectly safe, mostly due to the dual action on the calcium and the potassium currents. Now, I will show you a video now. Um, of the real experiment of how I recorded it, I will actually show you the video twice because it's pretty busy. So first I will explain you the, the user interface of what you see and the components. Uh, and then I will show you again the video, but then explain what our system is actually doing. So this is our interface, the Iron Wizard. You have your three panels. Um, you have um, the action potentials followed by the calcium transient and then the contraction. In uh, the lower left corner, you see this box where we calculate the contraction. And how do we find this? Well, we have an algorithm called center of contraction finding. So our system looks automatically through a dish, through a well of a 24 well plate and looks um, for a place where cells contract towards and only two words too. And this is what you can see, the self-finding window of where this magic is happening in the right corner. 
Okay, let's go on. Let's show this once more. So you see that this video in the right corner, it jumps from one um, field of view to the next. If it finds such a, such a center of contraction, it stops, it measures for five seconds, um, and then moves on, jumps to the next field of view, and to the next, and to the next, until it finds again a center of contraction like here, and then records again, fully automatically. This is all hands off. I'm not doing anything during this whole experiment except incubating with the drug. Uh, it looks for another center of contraction. It found again one. It records again five seconds, and then it will move, move on. And it, depending on how many you know center it should find, it will carry on um, as long as it you know, as you told them to. And the result is this. Uh, these are all the data recorded in this 30 minutes. Uh, and what you see, you have these black bars. These are basically these five second intervals. And then you have these red areas. And these red areas are pauses. You have the small pauses where in the beginning where uh, the system was looking actually for the center of contractions. And then these longer pauses where uh, we incubated with verapamil. First with 30 nanomoles, and then we measured again, and then we incubated uh, again with 100 nanomoles of verapamil. And the video that you just saw, this little snippet, is basically now indicated here um, in this blue box. So this is how it really takes in, in, in reality. Now, overall, during this whole experiment, um, we recorded 1,200 calcium transients, 1,200 action potentials, and 1,200 contractions. Um, and to analyze this all by hand is a bit tedious. So uh, we came up with um, a software called the Cytosolver that should help you with that. Um, what you do is you load your file, it automatically analyzes everything. Here it took around one and a half, two minutes. And then you can look at every segment separately and every transient in this segment separately. You can check your data, how the values look for each transient. When you're happy with your analysis, you export it. Here, export average transients. It's an Excel file. I also export the raw data. And uh, we are ready to go. Now you can take this data, you can plug it into your statistics software or your graphing software, generate your plots, and that's it. And um, that's also what I did. Show some plots, some results here. Um, these are the data for the action potential. On the left side, you see uh, the action potentials at baseline, the raw trace. On the right hand side, in the upper corner, the average transients. Um, of the experiment, first baseline, include the 30 nanomoles per mil, and then read the 100 nanomoles per mil, and the average data below. Um, you can already see with 30 nanomoles of per mil, we have um, reduction in your action potential duration, both at the 30 and the 70 percent mark, um, and more pronounced than after the 100 nanomoles of per mil. Now, when we look uh, to the calcium transients. Again, the raw trace on the left, the average calcium transients um, on the right on the top. Again, baseline 30, 100 nanomoles of verapamil. We see already by eye the calcium transient amplitude goes down, and this is confirmed by the average data. You see with 30 nanomoles, you have a reduction, and then again with 100 nanomoles of verapamil, even more so. Now, when you look at the return time, you see that there is actually no difference in the return time to 50% calcium transient between the baseline and the 30 nanomoles of verapamil. But a significant change, a significant shortening of the return time uh, when you look uh, at the 100 nanomolar. Uh, and here you have uh, the contractile data that line up very well with the calcium data. You see, again, uh, the raw data on the left with the contraction, the average contraction um, in the right upper corner, and, and the average data in the right lower one. You have a contraction, like the calcium transient, it goes down with increasing dose of verapamil, 
and the relaxation time also follows pretty precisely what we say uh, at the calcium transient. So there is no difference between baseline and 13 animals, but then um, a significant fastening of the relaxation time uh, at the 100 nanomolar level. Now, what can we conclude from um, this 30 minute experiment? We can conclude that when you have these automated recordings of your IPC derived myocyte, it can really speed up your throughput. Um, because we have this reliable way of measuring the same spot multiple times, we can um, increase the power of the experiment quite significantly. Um, and then because of this um, triple parametric imaging, uh, we can have a very nice assessment of the whole EC coupling cascade in one go. Uh, we did a bit of math. So with these 40 samples that you just saw, uh, we can resolve five milliseconds of action potential differences um, within these 30 minutes of experiment. Uh, and that with very good um, power and uh, um, significance. Now, I'm going to show you a second example. And what I'm not going to show you again, the uh, videos of the acquisition and the analysis, right? But it happened exactly the same way and exactly the same day um, in another well. Uh, and there is another way uh, to reduce um, your action potential duration, uh, and this time without a drug, but with um, pacing frequency. Now, the faster you pace, uh, your preparation, the shorter your action potential will get. And that's because of several mechanisms, that being uh, potassium currents not being fully inactivated, L-type calcium channels not being able to reactivate. And over time, you have some accumulation of sodium in the cell, and that modifies your sodium um, calcium exchanger and your sodium potassium pump. Now, when we look here at the average data, again, they were generated as before. On the left-hand side, you have the raw data uh, with 2 hertz and then paste with 4 hertz. You see the average traces uh, in the right upper corner, again, with 2 hertz and 4 hertz. 4 hertz being significantly quicker, um, the action potential is being shorter, also the calcium transit um, is faster, uh, and that is pretty much reflected in your average data. You have an action potential duration at 30 and 70% mark that are clearly significantly faster. And you have a calcium transient amplitude in these preparations that is lower at a higher pacing rate. Um, and at the same time, because the cell I mean, has to relax faster if it beats twice as fast, it indeed does at the 70% mark really um, take up a, um, calcium much, much faster than at uh, with two hertz. Now, uh, before I conclude and give back um, to Sarah, what can we take home from the first half of this webinar? That uh, we can now perform simultaneous multiparametric recordings of voltage, calcium, and contraction. Um, and that's feasible, it works pretty well, and it's easy to implement. I showed you the implementation for our high throughput system, but you can use it on a regular calcium and contractility system, or you can also use it on a myostretcher. So that is, it's pretty flexible. Um, when you do those experiments, you have to keep the limitations and the obstacles in mind. So your cell preparation, your dye loading, your protocols then need to be adapted um, for the model and for your question. But when you get this going, you have a good, a comprehensive, I would even say an excellent evaluation of your EC coupling in one go. Um, we could also show that as it is now, in this very moment, our software is already precise and accurate enough to analyze basic action potential parameters. And uh, multi-parametric recordings, in, especially in combination with our high throughput system, uh, can be a true alternative for the more traditional safety testing approaches. And with that, um, I want to thank everyone for their attention. And I will give back to Sarah. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Dr. Francisco Altimirano. Uh, Francisco, take it away whenever you're ready.
Thank you so much, Sarah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming today to this webinar. Mutations in polycystin 1 cause autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD. This disease leads to end-stage renal disease and is characterized by the formation of fluid-filled cysts in the kidney that they expand and they generate, causing renal failure. ADPKD manifests with multiple cardiovascular alterations, including cardiac and vascular disease, and numerous lines of evidence suggest that patients with ADPKD manifest systolic and diastolic dysfunction before the onset of renal failure. For this reason, our lab is interested in understanding whether polycystin 1 regulates cardiac function and the molecular mechanism driving these alterations. Recently, we show that cardiomyocyte-specific deletion of polycystin 1 cause both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, suggesting that this protein directly regulate both cardiomyocyte contraction and relaxation. And in this figure on the left, you can see by echo, we demonstrate a decrease in the fractional shortening. Um, and on the right, we measure diastolic function, and we observe that the E over E prime ratio was elevated in the cardiomyocyte-specific knockout mice, suggesting that there is a, a diastolic dysfunction. Indeed, we demonstrate that cardiomyocyte-specific deficiency uh, of polycystin 1 promotes alterations in calcium handling that is shown on the left, uh, in which the peak of the calcium transient was reduced, and alterations in contractility measured in isolated adult cardiomyocyte that is shown in the right, uh, and we use ionoptic technology to measure both calcium transient with FURA2 and contractility measuring sarcomere length during pacing. So in addition to these findings, we observe that polycystin 1 ablation shortens shortens cardiomyocyte action potential duration, and we hypothesize that these alterations uh, were the ones that were impairing calcium handling and contractility in PC1 deficient cardiomyocyte. Uh, we observe a reduction in uh, action potential duration at 50% of repolarization and also at 90% of repolarization. And there is evidence that suggests that action potentials regulate calcium handling and if they regulate calcium handling, they will affect uh, how the cardiomyocyte contract. And here, uh, there are some articles that show uh, that action potential duration can regulate how the L-type calcium channel activate and other channels too. And also they can regulate uh, the amount of calcium that you can store in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So to demonstrate that the action potentials were the ones driving the calcium alterations, uh, we use whole cell uh, voltage clamp and we uh, added fluorophore in the patch pipette so we can detect fluorescence changes and control the voltage of the cell using patch clamp. Using this technique, uh, we control the, the membrane voltage and we did two experiments. In the first one, we used the waveforms of the action potentials that we obtained in the previous figure that I show, uh, we, we obtain a control action potential or a shorter action potential waveform obtained from the PC1 deficient cardiomyocyte. And then we apply these uh, action potentials in the same cell uh, multiple times, and then we switch uh, to the shorter version and measure calcium transient elicited by these AP waveforms. Uh, and we demonstrate that when you apply a shorter action potential, the calcium transient generated what was smaller. And all these experiments were done in the same cell. So first we did the wild type action potentials, and then we did the knockout, and the same cell revealed that the shortening uh, impaired calcium transient. The second experiment was using the wild type and the cardiomyocyte specific knockout, and we use a square pulses. So if you have a fixed voltage and fixed duration um, that we control with the pipette, the patch clamp pipette, uh, we see the same calcium transient. So the reason why these cells were having uh, alteration in calcium transient was because the action potential was shorter. So 
uh, looking at the molecular mechanism, uh, we observe that uh, PC1 regulate many voltage-gated uh, potassium channels that participate in cardiomyocyte repolarization. And we provide some evidence that uh, is via a protein-protein interaction. Uh, here is an example of those experiments in which expression of PC1 in HEC-293 inhibits a KB4.3 current without uh, affecting its plasma uh, protein levels. And we identify that PC1 not only regulate KB4.3, that is the current, the potassium current ITO, we observe the same for IKS low 1 and IKS low 2 potassium currents in mouse ventricular cardiomyocyte. In summary, our previous work demonstrated that polycysteine 1 controls action potential duration to fine tune calcium handling and cardiomyocyte contractility among other mechanisms that I'm not going to explain in this webinar, and that PC1 deficiency in cardiomyocyte cause both systolic and diastolic dysfunction in mouse models. And as I mentioned earlier, our lab is interested in polycysteine 1 because this protein is mutated in patients with ADPKD, a human disease. But there are larger differences between mouse and human action potentials in terms of the shape and duration because they express different potassium channels. And as you can see in the figure, the currents that I mentioned, ITO, is present in both human and uh, mouse, uh, cardiomyocyte. But the other current, I guess, low one and two, they are different. And human cardiomyocyte show other currents that are known as IKS and IKR. So we hypothesize that PC1 control action potential duration, calcium handling, and contractility in human cardiomyocyte. And as a model to test uh, our hypothesis, we differentiated human-induced pluripotent stem cells into cardiomyocyte using a standardized protocol and kept them in culture for 60 to 90 days to increase the maturation and the percentage of myosin light chain 2V positive cells as a ventricular marker. And as you can see in the images, uh, most of our cells are positive for this marker. And this is considered a ventricular phenotype. And they have a more mature action potential shape uh, compared with younger cells. And to determine PC1 actions in cardiomyocyte, we uh, use a small interference RNA to knock down PC1 expression. And then we perform simultaneous voltage calcium and contractility measurements in this IPS-derived cardiomyocyte. The action potential were measured using fluvolt, uh, calcium with a dye that is calbright 590, and we use that because it localized mostly in the cytosome, uh, but has the caveat that is a slightly higher than KD, so I might lose some resolution in this recording, uh, but uh, the distribution is mostly cytosolic. And for the contraction, uh, we use the contrast algorithm the, from ion optics that allow to measure uh, contrast difference uh, between frames and give you a contractility index. So the idea is that um, here I'm showing a video in which uh, there is simultaneous measurement of action potentials, calcium, and the motion that is uh, getting detected by this contrast difference uh, during pacing. And we observe that PC1 knockdown shortens the action potential, reduce the calcium transient, and impair the contraction. And it is important to uh, say that this contraction index is based in contrast detection and does not represent fractional shortening or sarcomere length, so it's a semi-quantitative method to address uh, contractility. And this result suggests that uh, PC1 regulate action potential, calcium, and contractility in human cardiomyocyte. However, IPS uh, derived cardiomyocyte have many limitations because of their immature state in their cellular organization, electrophysiological properties, and metabolic activity. 
and also mature cardiomyocytes organize the sarcomeres in the longitudinal axis. And as you can see in the left panel on top, uh, there is an adult cardiomyocyte uh, stained for alpha actinin. And you can see that they are, all the sarcomeres are organized in the longitudinal axis. And as you can see on the bottom, uh, these IPS cardiomyocytes have their sarcomeres uh, oriented in every direction and they are not aligned. In addition, adult cardiomyocyte organize the plasma membrane uh, in a complex network of transverted tubules that are essential to transmit uh, action potentials deep into the core of cardiomyocyte, closer to the calcium release, release unit. So to overcome the limitation of this IPS cardiomyocyte, Dr. Norman's lab developed a protocol to improve the maturation of IPS derived cardiomyocyte based on a matrial mattress uh, that has less tension and cultural media supplemented with uh, higher doses of a uh, thyroid hormone and dexamethasone. And using this protocol, his lab demonstrated that IPS cardiomyocytes organize uh, their sarcomeres uh, in the longitudinal axis and also develop a network of functional t -tubes. Also, he demonstrated that this organization in the longitudinal axis allow uh, to measure contraction uh, of uh, this cardiomyocyte. Using a similar method, we were able to differentiate cardiomyocytes that contract in their longitudinal axis and organize their plasma membrane in T tubules. So we went to the confocal and got these pictures uh, with fluobold, and we can see some uh, invaginations of the plasma membrane although there are not too many and it's not similar to an adult cardiomyocyte, uh, these cells show some T tubules. And please refer to Dr. Norman's protocol for a validated approach because our data is still is preliminary. He uh, described better the protocol, how to differentiate these cells and obtain T tubules. But with these cells, we were allowed to uh, detect contraction uh, using this algorithm from uh, ion optics that detect the edges of the cell. And as we can see here, these cells that organize in the longitudinal axis, uh, they have contractions during pacing and we can measure uh, the fractional shortening using uh, ion optics algorithm. So we successfully uh, measure action potentials using fluobolt calcium transients with Calbright 590 and contraction using edge detection to calculate fractional shortening in the same cell. Uh, as you can see in the panels um, on the right, we observe that polycystine 1 ablation shortens the action potential, reduce the calcium transient amplitude and impairs cardiomyocyte contractility in mature IPS in uh, derived cardiomyocyte. In summary, I show that PC1 controls action potential duration, calcium handling, and contractility in both human and mouse cardiomyocyte. And I show that simultaneous recording of action potential, calcium, and contractility are a good model to study polycystine 1 function in cardiomyocyte. So I want to thank uh, Ion Optics and Inside Scientific for inviting me to this webinar. Also, the department chief at our institution, Dr. Cook, and the administration, Susmit and Ravi, uh, members of our lab, William Perez and Troy Hendrickson, my mentor, Joe Hill, and collaborators, and Dr. Valderrobano's lab. In addition, I want to thank the funding from UC San Diego Pride and NHLBI, Methodist Starting Fund, and AHA. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer your question during this uh, Q&E session. Thank you. So the first question is for you, Francisco. This question is, um, how does action potential duration regulate sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium load? Yes, so the SR uh, calcium loading process depends on the cytosolic calcium availability uh, that will be pumped uh, later by the SR calcium ATPA cerca. So most of the calcium influx occurs during the action potential plateau. And there's the option that this can go to the SAR uh, 
to refill the store. So longer action potentials can increase the load of the SR. And this is kind of a mechanism how frequency regulate also the SR calcium content. Okay, fantastic. Um, our next question is for you, Patrick. This question is, why not use FIRA2 free acid to record calcium transients instead, um, since this is a ratiometric dye and is more resistant to photo bleaching? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, when we came up with this way of, of measuring action potentials and calcium transient, um, my aim was to maximize for velocity, right? So if we do it with FURA2, we would need to switch very rapidly between the two excitation wavelengths, um, which, you know, we can only do at 250 hertz. So that is one problem. Um, you also get another um, excitation wavelength into the whole game, um, and you need to design your whole optical um, assembly um, based on these you know, requirements and with the combination of, of um, Fluvolt and the ROD2, we have m pretty standard um, optical equipment there that we can easily reproduce. Yeah, we didn't see that for Fura. Okay, great. Um, Francisco, this question is for you. Um, well, first, this person has said, thank you for your presentation. And then um, they've asked, do you recommend assessing contraction, calcium transients, and voltage in hypertrophic cardiac disease? Uh, yes, so in hypertrophy, there are changes in the action potential. Uh, the action potentials are longer, uh, and these produce some alteration on the calcium handling and contractility. So yes, so if you have a model of hypertrophy, studying the whole process of easy coupling with these techniques uh, will be very informative. Great. Um, Patrick, this question is for you. Um, this question is actually about um, one of the videos that you showed. So um, it's mm -hmm. what preparations were these measurements made from because it looked like a sheet of cells. Yeah, it was basically it, it was a monolayer. So we um, our collaborators um, in Amsterdam, um, they matured them for, um, I think, 30 to 40 days, um, and then they played them out. Um, so we can use them, you know, on a regular basis. But yeah, they are, they're monolayers of IPC cells. Okay, great. Um, Francisco, this question is for you. Um, it's about your work. It, it's asking, what's the typical concentration that you used for the fluorescent dyes? Yes, yeah, so the fluorescent, the calbride, we use it at uh, 20 micromolar uh, for half an hour loading. Uh, kind of we try with low amount, at room temperature, uh, with low amount, but we didn't have like a signal to noise ratio that was that good. Uh, so 20 micromolar, half an hour, uh, tw sorry, 25 minutes at room temperature. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, this question is for you, Patrick. Is it possible to record calcium voltage and sarcomere length at the same time? Yes, um, so we can do that. The only difference between uh, what I showed you in the webinar uh, with the stem cells and measuring the sarcomere length is just a different way of, you know, assessing contractility, but that's all within the same software. Um, and you can just, you know, when you design your experiment, you can choose how to look at sarcomeres or uh, or uh, to look at, at, at IPC cells. Okay, um, this question is for you, Francisco. Um, it is, is there any relationship between PC1 and alternate contractions? And have you looked at that? Yes, so we kind of are interested in alternance uh, and uh, because it's related to arrhythmias, right? Uh, and we haven't measured yet, but this is our plan. Um, and we kind of contact this person in the UK that developed an algorithm uh, to measure this alternate. So I can answer that question soon. Thank you. Okay, great. And in the interest of time, since we are coming up on the one hour mark, I'm going to make this our last question. Um, before I ask this question, I just wanted to remind you that if you do have any 
remaining questions for our speakers, please submit them using the Ask a Question panel and we will pass them along um, to them after the webinar and we'll create a Q&A report for you so you'll be able to get answers to all of your questions. Okay, um, Patrick, this last question is for you. Um, can the Cytosolver recognize unpaced contractions for analysis or contractions with very low amplitude? So yeah, um, I will make that a, a two-part answer. Analyzing contractions that are not um, stimulated, yeah, that's possible. Um, you can not only analyze them, you can also get your beating frequency out of this. So um, this is possible as long as you have a contraction trace. Um, and yes, it depends a tiny bit on how you are setting your, um, you know, your criteria, the analysis software, um, and then you can also analyze contractions with lower amplitude, but then obviously, you know, how much error you will introduce with this, this is kind of, um, yeah, then your own responsibility and say, okay, I can accept this type, type of error. Uh, then you can also relax this um, requirements for the amplitude height and analyze lower amplitudes. Fantastic, all right, well, um, I just wanted to thank you both again um, for your fantastic insights today. Um, and it was a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. You're the best.